Hey everybody, it's Andy Rock. It is June of 2020. This is the Coffee with the Geek show. We've got a lot going on in the world and we'll probably dig into that in our conversation here. But with me is Rochelle Denae Poth. And Rochelle is a Spanish and STEAM What's Next in Emerging Technology teacher. It's a great title at Riverview Junior Senior High School in Oakmont, Pennsylvania. She's also an attorney with a Juris Doctor degree from Duquesne University, School of Law, and a Master's in Instructional Technology. She's a consultant, speaker, and owner of Thrive EDU, LLC Consulting, and she serves as the president of ISTE Teacher Education Network, Go ISTE. She's the author of four books. Uh, they are called, in other words, Quotes That Push Our Thinking, Unconventional Ways to Thrive in EDU. The Future is Now, Looking Back to Move Ahead. And her latest is from ISTE, uh, publisher, and that is Chart a New Course, a Guide to Teaching Essential Skills for Tomorrow's World. And that is now available. Rochelle is also the first time I've had uh, a second speaker, the same person speak again on the Coffee with the Geek program. And um, there's a lot of people I can choose from, but uh, Rochelle's doing such inspirational work. So Rochelle, I guess my first line of questioning comes from, do you get any sleep? And you seem to be constantly working on something new. Uh, you're blogging, writing books, presenting, teaching, uh, maybe we should start there. What brand of coffee is powering you, or is it? Um, and how are you becoming so productive? Let's dig into those topics. Yeah, I don't drink any. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's the number one question that I'm, I'm asked is, like, do you ever sleep? And how do you do all these things? There, There is like a top five list of questions that I'm most frequently asked, but the sleep part is up there, number one, if, if not number one, number two. I do sleep, and it's not that I drink a lot of coffee. I actually, in fact, cut down the amount of coffee I was drinking, which wasn't even that much. It was just a morning stop at Dunkin' Donuts, and it kind of extra large, get me through the day. But I cut it down to one cup, but usually I start working on something, and I forget about the fact that I have coffee there. So it just sits, and then I reheat it or add extra water to it to get me through the day. But um, I do sleep. I probably don't sleep enough, but I really enjoy what I'm doing. I like to stay active. And so, I mean, that's, that's just, that's my life. <laughs> well, what are, you know, being so active, which is, I think a, a good thing. Um, how is, what are some tips maybe that you've discovered over the years to become so productive, to do so many things without getting yourself too stressed out? Well, I don't know if this is a, a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably a bad thing. We're always talking about self-care. And ironically, I had written a blog post back in the fall about 10 tips and 10 ideas that you can explore to be better with self-care. And that could apply to anybody. But with disconnecting, that is so hard for me to not look at emails or text messages or to put my phone in another room. And I know that I should do that, but I just, I can't because I feel like somebody might be trying to, to reach me or might need an answer to something. And so I've kind of turned that into a way to be a little bit better with managing my time and have some different hacks that I do. So I, I do practice self-care because I will go for a walk every day. I try to take like an hour walk, but during that hour walk, I'm listening to a podcast or I'm reading some blogs, catching up on emails or uh, any of those things in a combination during that time. So that's one thing that I do. Uh, another thing that I do is I use the power of voice to do a lot of my writing. And that's something that a few years ago, Jason Bretzman, I was at a conference in Milwaukee. It was the summer spark. And just, we had a break. I stepped into this other side classroom and just had some thoughts about a blog that I could write. So I opened up the document and I was just talking into my phone, pacing in the room. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm writing a blog. And he said, well, what do you mean you're writing a blog? I said, I'm just using the voice, the text. And so that is definitely a feature that I've made use of over the past probably five years now, almost uh, since I started in varying ways. I mean, with emails, with Twitter, with writing books, I use that a lot because when I go on those walks, I can think out loud, I can put them into the text. And granted, you have to go back and read it and check the words because it doesn't always pick up exactly what you said 
but it's kind of fun to think like, what did I say that sounded like, and then it's some weird kind of word combination, but it's a huge time saver. So just those couple of things really do enable me to do a lot of things kind of at the same time. So kind of changing things up and also just making sure that you're kind of relaxing your mind, <laughs> being unplugged a little bit too. So you've been up to a lot since the last time we've spoken. Can you tell me about your latest projects? And, and then we'll, we'll talk about your book after kind of the other things you've been doing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I have been doing a lot of different things. It's amazing over, I mean, if you would have told me five years ago or so, that's just when I started to work on my master's degree in instructional technology. But before that, I mean, I love teaching but I wasn't, I wasn't doing all that I could be doing. And so the past five years really have been a period of transition and transformation for me. So what I've been up to probably more so in the last two years is really trying to research a lot of different topics and learn about a lot of different areas that for a long time I didn't think were relevant to me as a language teacher. I just, for example, augmented virtual reality. I never thought, I taught it in my eighth grade course about emerging technology for STEAM, but I never thought that it was something that I could apply in my own classroom as a Spanish teacher. And even topics like coding or looking at social emotional learning, computational thinking, I've really been trying to invest more time to learn about a lot of these areas that we're seeing more uh, conversations happening about and questions coming up regarding these topics in you know, education now. So I, I do spend a lot of time trying to learn not just about resources for Spanish, but what's going on in the world of education and making sure that I find new connections and keep building my own network so that I can learn as much as I can and have access to the resources I need. So let's talk about the new book. Um... Let me re read the title and chart a new course, a guide to teaching essential skills for tomorrow's world. I mean, how, how timely is that? So talk me through that. And... Yeah, so this book is with ISTE. And what I did with this book is I thought about all of the changes that I had started to make in my own classroom over the last couple of years and thinking even now in when well, we made the, the transition to remote learning, remote teaching with the schools being shut down, there definitely there's no shortage of resources available for teachers and for students to keep learning going, but it's trying to find where do I begin? What is something that I can get started with that has a lot of uses for my classroom, for my grade level of students, whatever it is, uh, and being able to sift through all of that and get started. And so for me, I wanted to take all of the things that I've been doing in my classroom, some of which were my ideas, some are great ideas that came from my students after I tried something and it did not go well and they made a suggestion for how it could be better, but put all of that into a book that it's kind of interesting. You don't actually have to read it from cover to cover. You could look at one of the five chapters, find a topic that interests you, and then be able to walk away and get started with it the next day that you have class, uh, which is one thing that I, was really important to me. Like, I love to sit in front of the computer and learn, but to, if I can make it easier for somebody else to get started, then that's exactly what I want to do. So I guess... Talk me through how that kind of works. You know, we've just gone through so many schools closing and having to transition to an online learning platform. Is there, um, a, it just seems like it's a rich place to go with, with your book and, and your work. Um, can you talk about that? How, how you're seeing, you know, maybe the work you're doing, hopefully bearing some, maybe more fruit than anticipated with uh, pandemic and uh, schools having to do online. Yeah, in I mean, I can tell you just in my own experience at the beginning when this happened, my school doesn't have a tech coach. And so anytime that I learn something, I mean, it's, I think it's so great when teachers can share the ways they're using, and it's not about the technology, but if it is about technology or a different method or strategy, it's the power of sharing our stories. But whenever it happened, everybody was kind of like, I don't know where to begin. And it truly doesn't matter if you had been teaching online, if you knew all of the different tools that were out there, 
nobody was prepared for it. And so where I started, at least even for myself, I had a challenge was trying to figure out how do I take everything from my 42 minute class and put it all into the virtual space. And so I was trying to seriously do all of those same things, quickly finding out that I couldn't. And then for some of the teachers in my school and then other colleagues that, you know, their, their friends and PLN, trying to help them sift through like, what do you want to do? What is the most important thing that you have in your classroom that you want to see continue in this new space? And just as an example in my book, I mean, with students trying to help them build social emotional learning skills. And when we're in our classrooms, there's a lot of ways that we can do that because we're in that same space. But when we're not in our classrooms, how do we make that happen in the digital space? And for teachers, getting students to talk and communicate, collaborate in class versus outside of class what are the ways that we can do that? And as we've worked through this the past couple of months, now we're looking at the next school year. Will we have to be doing hybrid learning? Will we be fully distance learning? And what are the things that we can take back to that? And so being able to kind of navigate and share my experiences and say, okay, you don't need 10 different tools. What do you want to do? Do you want to be able to share a message? Do you want one, one space so students and their families can access it? Here are some tools that you can use to kind of, I mean, it's not going to replace those in-person interactions that we have, which I totally miss. But when you can have Microsoft Teams or you have things like Zoom and you can meet and actually see each other, even if sometimes it's not a synchronous meeting, it's just that voice or that video that you can share. It's starting with some of those options to start to build a sense of like, connecting in a community for your students and yourself. So this is really a predictive question. So take it for what it is, but do you see, I mean, with everything that's happened, do you see education making significant changes as schools start to reopen? Uh, do you see those as, as lasting changes, temporary changes? I know it's, that's a big question. You can take it a lot of different ways. Um, but we're just predicting here at, at this point. So what's kind of your prediction as to education? Will, will we see changes based off of this? I, I certainly hope so. I know that one thing that, that I've said and other people have said this too is like if you have been thinking about trying something different in your classroom but either didn't have time, didn't know where to begin, we're afraid that it would not go well in taking that risk. This has been the time to do it. And I also see how many teachers, just even ones that I knew that maybe didn't want to use technology or had been using the same tool for many years, getting away from those same methods and trying different things. And so I'm hoping that as we move forward, even if we are back in our classrooms, that we realize the potential for connecting our students with learning experiences that go beyond the walls of our classroom, which is something that I know, I mean, we've been talking about that for years, knocking down the walls with different ways like flipped or blended learning, hybrid learning, if you wanna call it that too. But I'm hoping that whatever teachers started to try now, that it continues and maybe not necessarily the same way. I mean, this is a period of learning and then looking at what we did, what was what went well what did not go so well and what should we take back because the biggest thing that i keep coming back to is we have to remember that even if we start the year back in our classrooms we might be in the same situation again where we have to make that quick change to remote learning and so whatever we're putting in place i think it's important to see what will the transition be like to go if we have to move quickly again because this first time we weren't prepared but if it happens again we have that experience that we should have learned from. And so I'm hoping at least that whatever new tools and experiences that teachers tried with their students, that they take some of that back to the physical classroom space and expand the how, where, and when learning happens. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to look at it is I think we really need to be, think more in terms of being nimble enough that should school stop tomorrow, we can transition to that. And I think having that kind of um, background planning in place. Um, hopefully that's, that's going to work. And I was, you know, I was thinking, I mean, as far as educational change, like did we actually break the rubber band or is the rubber band going to snap back into place and are people going to run back to their comfort zones and, and that sort of thing? You're shaking your head. No. <laughs> well, because I wonder the same thing too, right? Because if, if you leave your classroom and the last memory that you have of being in there was a lesson that you taught using the materials in your classroom or whatever the activities are, 
and then you've had this whole time where you've been out of it, then when you get back into that classroom space and all of those things are still there, is the likelihood that you're going to kind of move back into the way that you were doing things or, I mean, I think it will be a challenge regardless because we've had to adapt into this new space and we don't know, I mean, I don't know because I never taught Spanish or I never taught any class online. I've taken enough, but it has definitely been a learning experience for me. But I'm interested to know when I get back into that classroom space, what can I keep that I've been doing during this time that can expand and change what I was doing in my classroom uh, with my students. So definitely interested in seeing how that goes for sure. And again, I know this is a big question and, and you know, to try and get, you know, a complete answer, because again, it's, it's a predictive question is we were talking about it off offline here is um, the equity issue. Where do you see that? issue playing out as far as change for education? Yeah, I think that uh, it has been a huge part of conversations. I mean, everywhere you look now, there are resources being shared. And I was telling you, I was just in a webinar talking about it. And there are a series of webinars this month happening that I'm trying to get involved in too. And, and it's an area that I know for a lot of people, I mean, when you talk about equity, it, it's a tough conversation. And it's, it's something that I've tried to learn more about. And I think that we do the best by being connected and reaching out to other colleagues who come from different backgrounds and experiences than we do. And I hope that that is like the number one, I mean, the top of the conversation is focused on equity and what we can do individually, collectively to make sure that, you know, students have access to devices. I mean, in terms of that, like digital equity, uh, but then even looking larger scale, when we're talking about um, bringing up issues when it ties into social emotional learning and connecting our students to learn about different backgrounds and experiences and their whole awareness of people who are not all the same or don't have all of the same experiences and backgrounds that they do. Wait, you were muted. Thank you. Uh, is, it is going to be a challenging year, to say the least. I think exciting in some ways, because I think hopefully we will have learned some, learned some things, adapted and changed, and hopefully we'll uh, push those changes uh, for the better. Uh, it is time for the Speed Geek questions. So I've actually picked these ones out. Since you'd already gone through the, the spinning wheel of geekdom, I just picked out a few random, just quick answer. Okay. Fun questions for you. So the first one, I thought I'd spin it to uh, throw out kind of the arts. In times of, in times of trouble, I've always said, you know, embrace the arts, right? Uh, to, to lift you up and inspire you. So what is, um, do you have Netflix, any streaming service? And are, is there anything you're binging these days? I laugh. <laughs> you don't <because> have something. <laughs> I, people honestly do not believe me when I say I have never watched Netflix. If you were to name TV, like episodes, programs on Netflix, I wouldn't have a clue. I, I am not binge watching anything other than my computer screen and looking at student work. And that's about it. Yeah, I think the last time I turned the TV on myself was over a year ago. See, I've discovered your productivity secret without you <laughs> having to tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. So how about music and books? What, uh, what's on your music playlist? And what, uh, what books are you reading? I, Fun or professional, whatever. Uh, yeah, I have on my playlist, I, I do enjoy, I, I love all kinds of music, but I do enjoy listening to country music. And so when I go for a walk, I just have Google Play on and pick a couple of different radio stations or put my Alexa on and have her pull up some, I don't know, sometimes country music, sometimes Dave Matthews. Reading, I have a couple books on the way, so I'm not sure where I will start with those. I did just recently finish um, Next Level Teaching, and I'm trying to think what the other book was I have. I have a big stack of books that I need to get back to, but I was reading every morning. I was starting by reading 30 minutes of, of whatever the book was, but more recently, I've been reading a lot of different blogs instead, just to get a lot of different stories and ex exposure to a lot of different topics out there. Okay, so tell me, um, tell me what kind of a computer user are you? Are you a Mac person, a 
a PC person, a Chromebook user, or across the board? What are your devices? Yeah, I would say almost across the board. I, I was always a, a PC user, and then I had to get a new computer before ISTE the one year, and they didn't have the top three that I wanted. And uh, I wanted a larger monitor, and he tried to sell me on a Microsoft Surface, and I said, no, I want the larger screen. So I ended up getting, I have a Mac, but at school I have a PC, and I have tried using the Chromebook but I like to know how all of the devices work because not all of my students have the same devices. And so it's important for me to know functionality, accessibility for all of that. So I like to try to know enough about all of them, but always learning. So what is your, um, what are your blogs you're following these days or what blogs would you recommend folks to follow? I always check out Getting Smart, Edutopia, Ed Surge. Uh, and then I have some friends that write like Mandy Freilich. I'll look at her blog, Elizabeth Bostwick, and I'm trying to think of other ones. I mean, I have a, Laura Steinbrink is another one that I read. And anytime Bethany Hill is another one. There are so many that are out there that share them, whether on Twitter or on Facebook. And I just, I usually try to read them and retweet them. I always say I will I will not retweet it until I have read it because it forces me to make sure that I read because it's really important for me to see what my friends are reading, what other colleagues are reading. And so any of those, and actually on my own blog site, I've been highlighting uh, different guest blog posts because I wanted to share other stories. Plus it helps me to learn, but on my site, I do have links to a lot of the different blogs that I follow too. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Rochelle. You're doing just amazing work. I'm, uh, you know, you're truly an inspiration and, and the work you're doing is fantastic and keep it up and, uh, let's, let's make sure we keep in touch and, um, hope, yeah, to, see you, hope, hope to see you at ISTE or some, somehow, somewhere. I know besides just here in, in the virtual world, right? Well, thank <laughs> yeah. you. I always enjoy talking to you and I, I love the questions. I'm always anxious to see which, which question are you going to ask me? So it's good. <laughs> The Netflix one was a good one. Yeah, well, uh, like I said, it, it revealed a lot. <laughs> yeah, so I need to, it does. I need to give up my Netflix subscription. That's what I need to do. <laughs> That's what I've heard. I, I heard that saved you a lot of time. So. Yep. All right. Well, thanks again, Rochelle. Yeah, we'll thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. I'm going to end it there. I think my okay. camera was turned off when I introduced you. I don't know. Did you notice it? Did it seem like I was? Um. There was a point where your camera was off, but I thought you did it because somebody was coming through your background. Oh, okay. Okay. So you think like the intro I was okay on? I got to think back now. Because <laughs> you did, but do you want to do it again? Yeah. Do you mind if I just run through no. it real quick? I think nope. we've got a little extra time. So, I mean, yeah, again, if I'm good. You, you could tail off if you want to, but I'll just. No, run no, no. Again. All good. <laughs> Okay. I just saw a head come through the background. Yeah, yes, my son. <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody, this is the Coffee with a Geek program. It is June of 2020 and a lot going on with the world. There is, uh, we are still working through a pandemic, and uh, here in the United States, we're working through um, protests and riots, sadly, from the death of George Floyd. Um, and. <sighs> Oh, <laughs> I got so uh, emotional, it kind of threw me off a little bit. Yeah. So let me try that, that again. Well, that um, part, you were definitely on for that part. I was on for that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then I'm probably pretty good. And if I go back and edit it and find I wasn't going, I'll just, I'll just redo it live. Yeah. Sound good? Just, just let me know. And I'll just remember that I was wearing the, the greenish. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I mean... It may have just been maybe that first question too, because all of a sudden I noticed like, why is why is my camera not on? So oh. yeah, I thought you just did it quick because somebody was behind you, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I was probably That's trying fun. to mute and I hit the other. Okay, <laughs> well, it's it's an easy fix that I can make on my own. So thank you uh, so much. Yeah, thank you. Hope all right, you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, good to see you ya. too. Good to see you. All right, bye. bye, -bye.